What's up, guys? I'm Dr. Gabrielle Lyon here with my longtime mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman. And today we're going to talk to you about aging, protein efficiency, some of the things that happen as you mature. Anyway, Don, we were talking off camera about how you even got into this aspect of aging and efficiency. Yeah, I've uh, sort of been doing aging related research and I've done research across all of the lifespan from early childhood to older adults, but I kind of wandered into it by serendipity. Um, I had a, a great mentor back when I was doing my master's degree who actually was well known, Arlen Richardson in the field of aging. And we started studying uh, changes in protein synthesis during aging. and one of the things we discovered was that the, the messenger RNAs that we build, you know, come from the DNA and we build proteins from, uh, they have what's called a lead-in sequence or a poly A tail that actually, as you get older, that tail gets shorter and the, and the messenger RNAs become less efficient. Mm. Uh, that was kind of one of the first indications that as we get older, the efficiency of protein metabolism gets you know, goes, you know, gets less efficient, it goes down. And that kind of led into a lot of the thinking we did later that you actually need more protein as you get older. So the old thinking was, you know, growing children obviously needed more protein, but then we realized there's this efficiency thing, thing that goes on. And actually, as you get older, particularly after say 40, uh, you have a real downward curve that the efficiency is going down and you actually need better protein, more, better quality mm -hmm. and more protein to stay even. So it's been kind of an interesting path for me, but definitely been studying it for a long time. You know, I remember one of my first classes with you was childhood nutrition. There was some nutrition in the life cycle. Yeah. And, um, you know, for those people who don't know, I did my undergraduate in human nutrition, vitamin, mineral metabolism. And then serendipitously, I did a geriatric fellowship, obesity, medicine, nutrition, and, and geriatrics, which was all about the aging physiology. Yeah. When I first so got started, I was interested in muscle development. We were looking really at children and I got to do a international study, a US Agency for International Development in Morocco. And so I was wor working in Quash or core malnutrition with young children in Morocco. And so interesting. Then, then came back and I was working with uh, Dr. Mary Frances Pichano, who was an infant nutrition specialist. Mm -hmm. and. We did some early amino acid development and we learned you know, how the body actually began to develop to make some of these essential amino acids and some of the non-essential and, and the age process mm -hmm. of it. So it's been an interesting path to learn both about early childhood nutrition and older adult nutrition. One of, one of the ones I always find interesting is say, uh, histidine, which is an essential amino acid, but it's actually only ever been shown to be essential in children. It's never yeah. actually shown to be essential in adults. You know, and I, I'm not sure people really differentiate between that. No, it becomes important though, when you get into protein quality, because one of the measures of protein quality is to compare the limiting amino acid in a protein. And so for example, in soy, the limiting amino acid is methionine, mm -hmm. but in whey protein, which is a very high quality, the limiting amino acid is histidine. But as I just said, histidine is almost irrelevant. Right. So, you know, if you compare uh, soy and whey right. on the two limiting amino acids, they look a lot alike. But if you compare soy and whey on methionine, what you find out is whey's almost three times better than soy. And these are the nuances. And it's interesting because that's where the kind of plant-based discussion and, and some of the uh, you know um, more vocal people in this space will talk about that the plant-based protein is the same as say a whey-based protein and it's not. And it's based yeah. on some of these numbers. You know, yeah. it's, it's really important. You know, like you said, there's a lot of nuance to it yeah. and you really have to know what you're talking about and not be kind of lost in the advertising and marketing that gets put out there. Totally, couldn't agree more. 
When it comes to the aging research, tell me first about when mTOR kind of had its moment, because you did some of the early research on it. Yeah, um, we were we were studying um, muscle protein synthesis. This was back in the mid '90s, um, and a lot of other people were studying protein synthesis in liver. And at that point, they thought that uh, the primary regulation was an initiation factor called EIF2. Right. And what we realized was that could never be the limiting factor in muscle. So we started looking at another one called EIF4. And we teamed up with a group out at Penn State, Jim Jefferson and Scott Kimball, uh, mm -hmm. because they had all the antibodies for these proteins. And basically what we found was that uh, the regulation of muscle protein synthesis really depended on certain amino acids, leucine, uh, and it went through a mechanism that we found out to be mTOR. So mm. we were studying the endpoint, this initiation factor, and we realized the link between the diet, leucine, and the initiation factor was mTOR. And that sort of exploded a lot of the research that has gone on over the last 20 years. That's amazing. Yeah. So the people working in my lab right at that time were Tracy Anthony and Josh Anthony, who went on to work in Jim Jefferson's lab and published a lot of the mTOR-based data. Yeah, and Tracy Anderson is, um, Tracy Anthony, sorry, has done some really interesting stuff related to methionine restriction, yeah, which yeah. when you think about stressors in the body and methionine restriction is, obviously it's one of the amino acids, you know, I'm not sure what you think about that. I'm not sure that, you know, what that translates to. So methionine restriction, it's one of the amino acids. It's used in that fasting mimicking diet. And it's likely just creating a substantial amount of stress on the body. I mean, methionine yeah. is part of a very complex metabolism that is, it affects everything from the gene, the, the re repair and replacement of DNA and RNA to uh, folate metabolism, B12 metabolism, blood metabolism. So when you start creating deficiencies in all of those areas, it's hard telling how to interpret those. And so there's some very interesting research in rodents and it becomes kind of hard to translate that into humans. But I right. think methionine is a very interesting amino acid. And, and frankly, I don't think we know the whole story about it yet. I couldn't agree with you more. And, and one of the things that's important to know about methionine is that the, so a lot of these studies are done in rodents and the methionine need in rodents because they have hair is different than the methionine need in humans. So that, that can kind of confound the data a little bit and it's not necessarily translatable exactly in in the way that one would think. Yeah, just to elaborate what you said in case the audience didn't quite catch that, the, the fur on fur-bearing animals like rodents has a very high sulfur amino acid methionine requirement. So trying to extrapolate from, right. a, from a mouse or a rat to a human, there's a huge difference in our skin characteristics. <laughs> Unless you're hairy like my husband. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I gotta tell him that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think that that's really important. It's interesting, the aging data, it's going to be interesting to see how a lot of those recommendations change. Right now, this concept that we need more protein, there's this anabolic resistance concept, which absolutely I have seen, and this is the decrease in efficiency clinically, the decrease in efficiency of protein to be utilized by the body. And that was what Don was talking about earlier. It's that mTOR complex. You know, I'm curious as if there's other ways to stimulate it that, I mean, is it all been discovered as it relates to mTOR? I mean, I just feel as if there has to be some other way yeah. to kind of I, push I the envelope. You and, I have, you and I have talked a little bit about it before that when you look at mTOR, mTOR integrates a lot of different sing yes. signals. Uh, it definitely integrates one from 
amino acids, leucine, but it also in, integrates signals from arginine and methionine. Mm -hmm. So they're part of it. It integrates signals from hormones, insulin, IGF-1, integrates signals from energy through AMP kinase, which is primarily sensing ATP and glucose, and integrates signals from stress through something called RED1. Yeah. So exercise and, and overall stress can affect those. So there's at least four different kinds of signals coming in. Uh, and, and as we get older, the balance of those signals change. So I think you're right. I don't think we fully understand it. Um, yeah. There's, I, you know, I could come up with some of the nuances that don't make sense yet, uh, but we do know enough to know that as we get older, the dependency on the quality of protein and the dependency on physical activity, resistance exercise yeah. really de determines how healthy your muscles stay. Yeah. Those two facts we absolutely know. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I saw that doing my clinical research fellowship at, at WashU. Um, yeah, it, it will be great to see if things, if more information comes out uh, aside from those two factors, because it would be great to be able to translate that to practical use, you know, I mean, as the, it relates to prevention of aging. Yeah. I mean, the actual practical recommendations, I mean, right now we talk about three meals a day and 30 grams of protein. We don't really know that. We know that breakfast has a huge effect and having, having no protein or really low protein, it, we know that changing breakfast makes, we don't actually know what level of protein at lunch makes a difference. No which one's is ever fascinating. Which no is one's fascinating, ever studied guys. <laughs> yeah. uh, exercise, we know that resistance exercise makes a difference. We don't know the exact amounts or, or you know, how much, you know, we know that, you know, the volume, you can do lots of repetitions of a low weight or you can, so we don't know exactly the right balance, mm -hmm. but we know that they're both important. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? So you guys have to understand that there's still, that there's information that we know and that can be repeated. And that's really what good research is. And then there's a lot of things that we don't know. Yeah. And we could say for, you know, we can speculate, but there's that intellectual integrity in saying that, hey, this is what we know and this is what we're still trying to figure out, which I, I think is really important. You know, and I, you've taught me that over the last two decades, having that intellectual integrity of yeah. what is evidence based and what is more art and just conceptual. I mean, that's that's one of the funs and fun parts and also liabilities of being a nutrition. I mean, if you were if you were an organic chemist, people mm -hmm. don't know enough to ask a, a question. So you go on your merry way till you really know right. all the facts. But in nutrition, everybody's interested. So they ask you for a recommendation, even when you know that you don't know all the answers. And so they're looking for you to give them a recommendation. And, and uh, so we're we're always in that situation of trying to make the best recommendation we can based on what we think is true. And once in a while, we're gonna get that wrong. And that's okay, you guys, just so you know, um, it's okay to be wrong and it's okay to reevaluate. It's okay to change your mind. It's interesting in this world of social media, if you put something out, then you, if you change your mind, people get very upset and say, but you said this a long time ago. What you have to understand is that there is an evolution of thought and that there is evolution of data and there are new concepts. We're always learning. It's not yeah. static. I mean, there are certain foundational things that we know, but listen, those could change. Yeah. I mean, probably not, but I think one of the saving you know, graces in nutrition is that the human body actually can adapt to a pretty wide range of nutrition. Yes. And everybody wants to be all or nothing. I want to be yes. a vegan or a keto or a carnivore. You, they want the extremes, but the reality is there's a big middle ground that's all healthy. And the question is, how do you find one that is a good lifestyle for you, basically a healthy diet that you can live with? And the key is control your calories. Yes. The bottom line is, can you control your calories on the diet you'd like to be on? 
I think that that is also, that's just so important. We have a lot of argument in the space of whether should you be keto or paleo or high protein. And listen, I am certainly biased to high protein just because I've seen it work over and over and over again. But what Don is saying is absolutely accurate. It's what can you do over the long term? It's not that, you know, if an individual is vegan or plant based or higher carb, as long as, I mean, listen, you should have a certain foundational amount of protein. Sure. But other than that, as it relates to calories, whether it's protein or f- fat or carbs, doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, you know, I think all diets should be built around protein, but you can be lower or higher in protein and still make it work depending on your age and the amount of right. exercise. So, you know, I think people need to understand that diets are reasonably flexible and there's a pretty good range, um, you know, and, and, you know, arguing, you know, people get so invested in, in being right about it, but there's really a big range that can work. And, you know, you and I are, are both, you know, have seen enough examples where we know that Americans in general are eating too much processed food and that is basically carbohydrates and fats. Right. And so those are what you need to take out. And uh, there's been this drumbeat forever that people are eating too much protein. And it's kind of a vegetarian anti-animal slogan. But the reality is protein really needs to be the center point of a diet to make it healthy. Totally agree. Obviously. I mean, we've been doing this work together for quite some time. I like what you said too, is that it's more important to be effective than it is to be right. Mm. And that is important as it relates to the conversation. It's also important as it relates to the nutritional aspects. You know, it's more important to be effective rather than arguing your point to be right or arguing Mm. one's point to be right. And and I I do see a lot of that and it's, it's unnecessary, you know? Totally. (laughs) All right, guys. Well, listen, I hope you find this valuable. I certainly do. Even after all these years, like the video, share it, comment. I try to get to all the questions and um, hope to see you next time.